Chang in San Francisco and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, U.S. stocks climbing to a record amid evidence the economic recovery is gaining momentum. And we'll check in on Tesla after it reported record first quarter deliveries. Plus, vaccinations pick up speed in the U.S., but variants still a huge concern. We'll get the latest on efforts to stop the spread of COVID-19, especially when it comes to children and travelers. And changing the face of entrepreneurship, Apple and PayPal are just two big tech firms committing to Harlem Capital Partners in an effort to support more Black and Latinx founders through venture capital. We begin, though, with the markets in the U.S. stocks reaching records to kick off the week. Bloomberg's Katie Greifeld and Abigail Doolittle have the latest. Katie, let's start with you. Well, Emily, it was green across the screen today as U.S. traders had their first chance to react to that blowout job sprint from Friday. And you can see the S&P 500, the NASDAQ 100, your semiconductors index all ended firmly higher today. And I want to point out that you saw tech break away from the broader S&P 500 as that rise in rates cooled just a little bit. You see the 10-year Treasury yield yield ended just about flat at 1.7 percent and switch up the board because this is a trend that has been in the works for the past few weeks. You can see that the S&P 500, it's about 8.6 percent higher on the yield on the year. That's higher than the Nasdaq's five and a half percent gain. But as you can see, just in the past few weeks, you're starting to see tech make up some ground here as that sell off in the bond market starts to stall out just a little bit. And let's switch up the boards one last time because I want to point out that you can see this clearly in the ETF flows, Abigail. The QQQ ETF, that tracks the NASDAQ 100. It's seen two straight weeks of inflows over $2 billion. So clearly, Abigail, investors are getting more comfortable owning those expensive tech shares again. They certainly are with rates and yields lower at the time, Katie. It does seem to be helping this mini rotation that we're seeing into technology. And not surprisingly, behind those QQQ inflows, in terms of the stocks that are really performing well, we're looking at Microsoft, Facebook, and Alphabet record highs right across the board there for Facebook, the first one since last August. Not really a new fundamental news. Apple also in on the party. Lots of green on this tech screen. Investors simply want in on this year's catch-up trade because, of course, up until just last week, this had been the trade that had underperformed on the year as yields had gone higher and really brought valuation into question. Now, speaking under pressure, GameStop ending the day lower but well off the lows at the lows i recall earlier today down more than 10 percent and this of course as the company is going to offer up to one billion dollars uh, in shares a secondary offering clearly investors worried a little bit about dilution the more amazing thing though is the company smartly taking advantage of the share price not so long ago nine months ago this was a four dollar stock now even under pressure it's a 187 dollars stock Overall, investors looking past that weakness. And at one point midday, the stock was even green. Speaking of green, Emily, let's end on the big one. And of course, I'm talking about Tesla, really soaring on the day, up 4.4% earlier, up even more. This, of course, on that blowout first quarter uh, delivery number that you were talking about. They delivered nearly 185,000 electric vehicles in the first quarter, about 15,000 better than the estimate. And it's very clear, Emily, that their move into China and Europe really paying off. Also interesting, the rest of the EV space early on soaring, not so much at the end of the day, but Tesla did hold on to those gains. One of the best stocks for the S&P 500 and certainly that tech heavy NASDAQ 100. All right, Abigail, thanks so much. Now, as Abigail mentioned there over the weekend, Tesla reporting stellar first quarter numbers, blowing past analyst expectations and helping it defy that broader sell off in the electric car industry. This amid growing skepticism about the future of President Biden's infrastructure bill, shares of Tesla jumping, erasing most of the company's year to date loss. Over the last year, the stock has advanced more than 600%. For more, we're joined now by Oppenheimer's Colin Rush, who currently has an outperform rating on the stock. So, Colin, first of all, when it comes to deliveries, how did Tesla defy the odds? Record deliveries in a pandemic, and at least in the U.S., an economic recession. Yeah, I think it's important to, to understand the sophistication of their supply chain management. I think they, they saw a lot of these issues coming early and really kind of stuck into uh, a couple of key markets in the U.S. and in China where they, they didn't have to have such a long uh, 
logistics timeline to get the cars into the hands of the, the consumers. So I think it was a, a combination of seeing these things early, getting the components to where they need to be uh, in, in a timely way, and then delivering uh, close to home with the with the factory. So given that delivery number in the first quarter, how many cars do you think Tesla will deliver in all of this year, 2021? You know, they have a shot at, at you know, going above 900,000 this year, and, and certainly this is a good start. Um, you know, I, I think as we look out across the landscape, you know, they need to uh, procure some batteries. Like, that's, that's a key element. Obviously, there's the chip shortage, but there's, the demand is there. Uh, consumers really do want these vehicles, and they certainly have uh, a lot of folks that are looking for them right now. And, and so it's really incumbent upon them to just produce them uh, to hit those numbers, but certainly 900,000 or more is, is within their own possibility. We're still dealing with this chip shortage, though, and I'm curious if the number surprised you, given how so many other uh, companies, industries are suffering because they can't get the chips they need. Well, you know, they've got, you know, dedicated supply for their own chips around the, the FSD program. And so, you know, we think they have very strong relationships with those, those chip makers. We, we do think that they are one of the highest growth uh, platforms for EVs and, and certainly a technology leader within that, that technology node. And so they are a priority for a number of their suppliers. And one of the things that we're seeing across the board is that the, the, the larger buyers are getting the components. And, and we think Tesla is a, a strategic customer for a lot of their suppliers and, and so had a little bit easier time. But again, I don't want to de-emphasize the, the point here that they saw this coming early. They did this well in, in 2020 in terms of seeing the, the impact of COVID and, and preparing for it. And we think they, they saw the, the re-ramp in the economy coming early and, and uh, adjusted accordingly. Tesla now making the Model 3 and the Model Y at its factory in Shanghai. How concerned are you about the Chinese government banning Teslas at military complexes and housing facilities, given security concerns about the cameras inside the car? Is that a big deal? Yeah, I think it is, you know, and it's not a huge surprise. You know, we've, we've got, you know, a, a lot of, uh, you know, inter, interdependency between the two countries. There's obviously a lot of com competition. There's been some concern around Huawei in the U.S. And so I think there's going to be ongoing, you know, elements of, of this, this trade negotiation that, that come that are expressed through the companies. And, and we've seen that historically, both in China and in the U.S., where there's restrictions placed on, on these companies. And so, for, for Tesla, it's interesting that they have a wholly owned subsidiary in China. They're really the only foreign company that has that in, in the auto space. And we think they brought a, a fair amount of IP into the country around battery manufacturing and battery chemistry. Uh, and, and so we're able to get that ownership stake. But as you look at some of the communications technology and the visualization uh, sensor suite and, and what that really means for those vehicles as you know potential assets for, for foreign countries, we think it's really um, you know, it's a risk for everybody, uh, whether it's in the U.S. or, uh, or overseas, and, and there's going to be some restrictions on that. I don't think it really slows down the sales of those vehicles, but it is going to, uh, you know, slow down some of the, the consideration on uh, how those vehicles get used. Uh, and, and really, it's going to need to narrow, or Tesla's going to need to narrow their focus on who they're targeting with their customers. But right now, the opportunity is so much bigger than their production. We're not really concerned about that impacting numbers for several years. So you've got an outperform. What do you think the next big catalysts or risks are to the stock, especially with this potential big infrastructure bill from President Biden in the offing? Yeah, it, our view is that the infrastructure bill is a nice to have for uh, for our call on Tesla. It, it's a, the root of, of what we're expecting here over the next year or two is really to see Tesla leg out in front of their competition even further with their full self-driving functionality. They've got over a million cars on the road that are uh, collecting data, you know, and, and we see about 6 billion miles necessary to roll out new functionality. We think Tesla can, can roll out that sort of testing on the road in, in less than six months. Uh, you know, to put this in perspective, that million vehicles is compared to several thousand vehicles for all of our competition. So their ability to test and validate um, new functionality is, is really operating in order of magnitude uh, faster than their competition. We think that's the real key to the, the stock from here, and, and that's why we're so bullish, that they do have this uh, really robust AI uh, system that's testing and validating that data that they're pulling in. And really, I think they're going to be able to roll out new functionality in advance of their competition and really move into level three plus and even level four, eight as before their competition. All right. We'll be watching, as will you, Colin Rush of Oppenheimer. Great to have you back on the show, Colin. Thank you. Coming up, after years of scrutiny, Facebook 
fails to protect personal information yet again, leaving the data of hundreds of millions of users widely available online. We will have the details next. This is Bloomberg. After months of lagging, Facebook shares surged to a record high at the start of the week with big tech stocks also rallying amidst optimism about the strong pace of economic growth. Facebook is scheduled to report first quarter results later this month, Wall Street expecting both earnings per share and revenue to rise more than 30 percent, according to data compiled by Bloomberg. The stock rally coming after a cybercrime intelligence firm discovered that the personal data of more than half a billion Facebook users reemerged online for free. Saturday. The leak, a reminder of just how much information the social network collects about its users and how it has failed to protect that information. For more, I want to bring in Bloomberg's Kurt Wagner, who covers social media for us. So yet again, Kurt, this divergence between um, bad news about Facebook and the stock going up, I don't get it. Why? Uh, I think that when you look at this kind of data, um, first of all, it's old. It's, it's a couple years old. Uh, that still doesn't look very good for Facebook, but I think people have kind of come to peace with this idea that the business operates in this weird silo that the you know press and the uh, publicity of the company just doesn't seem to affect, right? I mean, we have seen so many issues with Facebook over the years, including privacy issues, a $5 billion fine from the FTC for privacy issues, and yet Facebook just keeps making more money adding more users, people spending more time. So I think people have just gotten very comfortable with the idea that the business can be separate from bad press that the company gets. Well, and I wonder if perhaps we're too comfortable with news about our data being leaked online yet again. What exactly happened here? I know Facebook says that the data is old, but does it matter? No, I mean, it doesn't matter because if it's your phone number and your, you know, username uh, and your email that's out there, it doesn't feel very good, right? And the problem with Facebook and these data leaks is that, yes, the data is a couple years old, but you can't get that back once it goes onto the web. You know, once there is a vulnerability, even if Facebook says, hey, we fixed this issue a couple years ago, well, the data is already out the door, right? You can't collect it. You can't bring it back. And so... That is the troubling part is that these companies will kind of suggest, hey, we fixed it. It's not a problem anymore, but it, it is a problem because this is the kind of stuff that lingers and affects people long term, right? There's obviously identity theft issues when, when people can have all that type of personal information about you. And so it's a little disingenuous to say, hey, this problem is fixed when really once the data leaves, th there's no fixing this. What exactly was stored online? You know, if you're a Facebook user, what should you be worried about right now? Well, the big stuff from this was uh, um, phone numbers and obviously emails. And those are things that, uh, you know, people use for logins or things that people use as identifiers. You know, oftentimes when I sign up for a new account, I'll do so with, with my phone number and they'll text me codes, right? Hey, in, enter this code to, to access your account. That's the kind of stuff that can be a little scary for people. And so while a lot of this is the kind of information you might readily share with someone you trust or someone you know, it's still not the kind of stuff that you want on the internet for anybody to see. And so I think that's where things have, have you know, maybe scared people a little bit or simply reminded them that this is the kind of data that Facebook has uh, access to. Meantime, Russia and Twitter have been at odds. The country has been threatening to block access to Twitter inside, um, inside of Russia as a result of content on the platform. There have been some developments there. What's happening? Well, we have seen this play out in other countries um, before, right? I mean, you think of obviously China, where Twitter uh, is not able to operate. You think of Turkey. Uh, you think of other countries kind of in the Middle East where there are governments that are very strict around uh, rules of the Internet and what they believe should be allowed to be shared. And so we're seeing this play out with Russia right now. Uh, the two sides uh, apparently met over the weekend, and, and basically Twitter is going to act more aggressively to remove uh, illegal content at the behest of, of the Russian government. But, you know, that's a, it's a fine line to walk, right? These companies are always kind of walking this where they're trying to be as helpful as possible to bring down actual illegal stuff while not necessarily taking down stuff that should be, you know, free speech or, or activism and things like that. And so 
Uh, this is, again, not unique to Twitter and Russia, but obviously a huge country uh, with a lot of uh, influence and a lot of interest here in the United States. So it's something that we're watching. All right. Bloomberg's Kurt Wagner. You'll keep us posted. Thanks so much. All right, coming up, one venture capital firm aiming to change the face of entrepreneurship by investing in 1,000 diverse founders over the next two decades. We're going to talk to Harlem Capital's managing partner next about how they plan to put a $134 million fund to work. This is Bloomberg. A big win for Google at the U.S. Supreme Court. The justices ruling that Google did not commit copyright infringement when it used Oracle's programming code in the Android operating system. The victory spares Google from having to pay what could have been billions of dollars in damages. The 6-2 ruling marks a climax to a decade-old case that divided Silicon Valley and promised to reshape the rules for the software industry. Meantime, Black and Latinx founders raised just 2.6% of overall funding in the U.S. in all of last year. This according to Crunchbase. But Harlem Capital Partners is working to change that number. The venture capital firm recently closed another fund at $134 million, more than its target. And among its investors are PayPal and Apple. The iPhone maker saying earlier this year it's committing $10 million to support Harlem Capital's mission. Joining us now for more, managing partner Henri Pierre Jacques. Henri, thank you so much for joining us. Thank so, you. talk to us about that mission. How do you convince a company like Apple to get on board? Yes, yeah, so our mission is to change the face of entrepreneurship uh, by investing in a thousand diverse founders over 20 years. I think after last summer, obviously, a lot of corporations have kind of self reflected. Uh, we were fortunate to introduce to Apple last fall. Uh, they were looking to make an investment in the fund, and, and after a couple of months of uh, getting to know each other, there's just a lot of synergies between what we we're uh, trying to accomplish together. So talk to us about the kind of founders you're looking for, the kind of companies you're looking to support. Yeah, so we're early stage, so we invest uh, usually post-product, sometimes pre-revenue, sometimes early revenue. Uh, our mission, obviously, is focused on diverse founders, so we largely invest in people of color, women founders uh, that are based in the United States and largely focus on technology focused companies. So whether that's enterprise tech uh, or consumer tech, we're looking at companies across industries like FinTech, e-commerce, uh, wellness, HR tech, et cetera. But we have a pretty broad scope. You know, our mission really drives us. We just want to invest in the best diverse founders that are in large markets. Now, to us, the answer may be obvious, but to others, it may not be. Why is it important to support diverse founders? Why aren't their ideas getting enough funding and support? Yeah, I mean, the biggest data for us, uh, Jared, my partner, and I were at Harvard Business School, and we were doing our independent project. And 4% of funding goes to Black, Latino men and women of all races. And that represents 70% of the U.S. population. And so that 27X Delta was pretty clear to us that there that wasn't because of meritocracy, right? And so there wasn't a lot of data we could actually find to like prove do diverse founders do better. Um, but like our clear thing was like this just should be on parity. The the population should be on parity to who people are investing in. And, and often the narrative is, you know, do diverse founders produce better returns? There's a lot of data on this in the public markets, but the, I think that shouldn't be the framing. The framing should be are they just as good? Like why do diverse and women founders need to be better than the majority for you to invest in them. And so I think that's just like a mind shift for us was like, we don't need you to be better, but we know that you're good and we want to invest in you. And right now, 27 times of you are, you, of you are getting back less than, than your peers. Now, one of the things that's really unique about your fund is what you're calling culture carry, which means the founders you invest in will be able to share in the returns of, of the entire fund. How does it work and why are you doing that? Yeah, one of our founders uh, asked if he could invest in fund two, which we thought was a huge honor. And, you know, the thought became, why should our founders have to put up money into the fund when if we're going to make money from the fund, it's only going to be because of the work our founders are doing, right? And so the first thing idea was, how do we give our founders 
equity in our fund without them having to put up money because they are the reason we even exist. The second piece for us was Harlem Capital really to us is the diverse ecosystem. And how do we have our founders want to support each other even more? And so because of the way venture works, we're going to invest in 45 companies in fund two, probably five, maybe 10 will actually generate all the returns for the fund. And so 30 to 35 founders who are going to be with us will have a successful journey, but that success won't mean that they're going to make money necessarily. And so how do we make sure that it's a way where if one of our founders wins, all of our founders wins, win. And that incentivizes each of our founders because nobody knows who's going to win. We all believe we're going to be the winners, but you don't actually know. And so it incentivizes our founders to actually create a community where it's like, hey, I'm going to support you because I am in an environment where all of us are going to win. I wonder if you think that's something, a model that other VCs, other organizations could take on. Like, should more of Silicon Valley be doing this? Yeah, I mean, I think you're seeing this at the corporate level, right? People are pushing down. CEOs have more equity. They're trying to disperse that across more employees. I Looks like we lost Henri there, but obviously such an important, fascinating mission and very supportive of the work they are doing. Henri Pierre, Jacques, managing partner at Harlem Capital Partners. Um, we'll, we'll get that online for you so you can see the full segment. All right, coming up, COVID-19 variants versus current vaccines. We're going to take a look at how much protection they give and why one isn't faring too well against a South African strain, a really scary one. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. For some of the top movers in the markets today, we're joined by Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle for a check-in. Abigail, wrap it up for us. Well, Emily, today with the rally for the S&P 500, new all-time highs, well above 4,000, it was all about the reopening trade. So a big piece of this, what is now being called the leisure trade, business and leisure. So JetBlue really sharply higher, up about 4%. Upgraded over at Raymond James, the thought that many folks are going to be using uh, some of the East Coast beaches more. That is helping out more domestically based JetBlue. But all of the airlines higher on the idea that folks are traveling more. Last Friday uh, was the biggest check-in for TSA, I think 1.6 million travelers since the pandemic began. Norwegian Cruise Lines, they're saying they're going to be back in the water by July. Now, there are some complications with the CDC, but you see investors responding extremely well to that. The same deal for MGM Resorts were seeing a favorable upgrade at Morgan Stanley saying Las Vegas is about to be on fire. And AMC, speaking of being on fire, Godzilla versus Kong, that really drew folks to the theaters. AMC is up, up, and away. And that is actually the deal for the pleasure category overall. Uh, hotels and airlines, if we go into the Bloomberg Terminal and take a look at over the last year, what we're looking at here in blue, that is the S&P 500 hotels, resorts, and cruise lines. In white, we're looking at the stay-at-home names. Now, we see for the most part, over the last year during this rally, they have very closely tracked each other. But over the last month or so, two months, we see that the travel stocks really taking off. This has everything to do with the stimulus checks, plus increasing confidence and optimism around the vaccine. And then finally, if we flip up the boards, what we are going to see here, two of the big vaccine uh, companies, 
very interesting. In blue, or excuse me, in orange, we're looking at Moderna, and white, we're looking at Pfizer. And both of these stocks have done very well. But more recently, we've been looking at a little bit of sell new, the news action, especially for Pfizer, Emily. It's very interesting. Over the last year, Moderna up more than 200%. Pfizer only up a little bit more than 10%, probably has to do with the fact that the vaccine is a smaller part of their portfolio. But overall, you can see that these stocks have been helped out in the stock market overall and sentiment being helped out by many, many people now on their way to either being vaccinated or getting vaccinated. All right. Yes, they are. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle, thanks so much for that update. Now, more than half a billion vaccines have been given against COVID around the world, up from just about 10 million at the start of the year. But new variants of the virus continue to make headlines, with researchers attempting to track whether the current vaccines are doing enough to protect us. With me now, Bloomberg's Michelle Cortez, who covers health tech for us. So, Michelle, talk to us about these variants. How much protection do the current vaccines that are on the market actually have against these new variants, specifically South Africa, and Brazil. So you have narrowed in specifically on the variants that are the biggest issue for the world at this point. The vaccines that we have are significantly less protective against especially the South African variant. Now we're looking at the, the Moderna and Pfizer mRNA vaccines that are about six to eight folds less effective against that variant although they do still provide some protection. The AstraZeneca vaccine doesn't seem to be helpful at all against the South African variant, and the Johnson & Johnson one provides some protection. The most widespread variant, of course, is the one that came out of the UK. The, the vaccines do appear to be very protective against that. The Brazilian one falls a little in the middle there. But the bottom line is, is that we are still getting some protection from the vaccines against all of these variants, with the exception of that AstraZeneca shot. The concern is, is that the variations aren't going to stop. The mutations are going to continue to happen. And what public health officials are really wor worried about is what happens next. Pfizer is testing a third booster to protect against some of the variants. What is the status of that? And if we're going to need a third booster in general, or I guess a second if you got J&J? &J? Right. Well, there's a couple of pieces going on here. So there is the idea of, a, of another booster. You can think of that almost as like a, an annual flu shot, you know, an annual COVID shot. Are we going to need something that's going to goose our immune system to kind of remind them that this, bear, that this virus is out there and to get our immune systems on high alert every year that will give some kind of additional protection? And we've seen that even, you know, in all of the epidemiological work, right, that it's, if you've gotten the COVID before, then you get your first vaccine. It looks more protective. If you haven't had COVID before, you need that second vaccine. So it's that second exposure that seems to be most helpful. The other thing that's happening here beyond just getting another one of this exact same shot, the beauty of the mRNA vaccines is that we can develop them very quickly. So both Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna are working on a next generation vaccine that specifically targets the South African variant. And they're also working on the UK and Brazilian variants. So they want to actually have another vaccine that would be available to people should we need it. And then there has been some progress when it comes to kids uh, age 12 and up. Um, what about kids that are younger than that? When can we expect those children um, to have access to vaccinations and for adults who do get vaccinated, do they still need to be careful for their children at home who aren't vaccinated? Well, we do know that children are much less likely to get infected and are less likely to have severe cases. But of course, if you're if you're unimmunized, if you're not protected, then then you're not protected, and there there is danger there theoretically, specifically that they could perhaps be carriers of the of the virus and be spreading it to other unvaccinated people. It is probably going to be a while before we get definitive evidence on how well these youngest kids do because the focus is going to be protecting everybody in the higher risk group. But the numbers that we've been getting so far are really remarkable in in younger children, in adolescents and young children that that any vaccination at this point appears to be very effective in them. So we are 
increasingly doing the clinical trials, and the number of vaccines that are being manufactured are increasing at a significant pace. So I do think that in the next coming months, we are going to be getting to some vaccination of these younger ages, and hopefully it's going to be just as effective, if not more so, in those younger kids. So, Michelle, how do you expect this to evolve? Do you think that we will be getting a yearly booster booster of the vaccine that will be separate from the flu shot uh, you know, annually and that it won't necessarily matter what brand you get year to year just over time? When we look at the, the way that the that viruses work in general, you can tell, is this virus going to be like influenza, which mutates very rapidly, you need an annual flu shot, or is it going to be like measles, which is a very stable virus? And in fact, if it mutates at all, it usually harms the, the measles virus itself, and that virus, that strain tends to die out. At this point, it is looking like COVID is going to be more like influenza. Whether it's going to need an annual shot is, is unclear yet. It does seem, as I said, that some of these initial variants are still responding to the vaccines that we have. But most likely, this is going to be with us for a while, and we are going to be needing COVID shots. I mean, that I'm not a doctor, but that would be my guess. We do know that the companies are working on combination injections already at this point. So you might get a flu COVID combination shot that will be happening every year. The mRNA vaccines would obviously be able to adjust every year so that they're targeting the specific circulating variant. We probably get a higher effectiveness level. Hopefully, we'll get these mRNA vaccines for influenza and we'll have a, a really effective influenza shot, which we really generally don't have. But I do think that it is something that we're going to be getting. Hopefully, you'll just get it at the same exact time with the same needle as your flu shot, and we'll both we'll get them all every year together, and it'll be. Uh, we'll be in a better position than we are currently. All right, Michelle, always appreciate your very informed reporting on this. Bloomberg's Michelle Cortez, thank you. Well, from vaccines to NFTs, we're switching gears a bit to some of the top market trends happening right now. Bloomberg's Laura Cooper breaking it down. This is Market Bites, where we give you three things to think about when it comes to markets. This week, it's all about NFTs, hot housing markets, and the U.S. dollar. NFTs, non-fungible tokens. These are blockchain-based records of information tied to a particular digital asset, ranging from video clips of sporting events to a tweet to an online image. Anything that someone can find value in can be digitized as an NFT and sold on cryptocurrency markets. A photo montage sold for nearly $70 million in a recent auction. That's the most ever paid for digital art. There are skeptics, but when anything can be digitized, the trend is gaining popularity. Hot housing markets. Extraordinary government stimulus has put residential property into an investment sweet spot, with home prices shooting higher across major economies. Now, while the hot streak in housing may cool as interest rates rise, residential real estate has performed better than equities across major economies over the past five decades. While returns were comparable, averaging about 7% per year, housing wins on a risk-adjusted basis. And the asset's built-in inflation hedge suggests housing activity has further room to run. The US dollar. Rising bond yields and upbeat U.S. growth prospects boosted by trillions of dollars in government spending are challenging that 2021 consensus trade for dollar weakness. Yet a ballooning current account deficit as the government funds trillion in stimulus alongside widening trade deficits suggests the dollar can come under pressure. Unleashing spending to boost growth does come with a cost and a big dollar sign in front of it. That's it for this week's edition of Market Bites. I'm Laura Cooper. For more market insights, be sure to tune in to Quick Take and Bloomberg. Bloomberg's Laura Cooper there. Well, Tim Cook doesn't expect to be running Apple 10 years from now. Cook became CEO almost a decade ago after the death of co-founder and former CEO Steve Jobs. He told the New York Times a departure date is not in sight, but he probably won't be there another 10 years. Cook has been with Apple since 1998.
All right, coming up, how travel could be changing and why we might soon see vaccination passports. We're speaking to the CEO of Star Alliance, Jeffrey Goh, about the state of the travel industry in our work shifting conversation next. This is Bloomberg. Breaking news, President Biden, Bloomberg reporting, likely to name Sarah Bianchi as his deputy trade chief. Bianchi, uh, senior managing director at Evercore ISI International at the moment. She also worked at BlackRock and Airbnb and is on the advisory board of the Biden Institute at the University of Delaware. Um, he is expected to appoint her as deputy U.S. trade representative, obviously a very important job. We'll continue to watch uh, if indeed that appointment happens. She, of course, also served uh, in the Obama administration. All right. A year ago, reservations for airlines, hotels, cruise ships anchored to an all-time low amidst a global pandemic. But as vaccines continue to reach more people, travel is resurging. U.S. passengers hit a new pandemic era record at 1.6 million over the Easter weekend. That's mostly domestic travel. But what about post-pandemic voyages, including business travel, that involve crossing borders? Will you need a vaccine passport? With me now, CEO of Star Alliance, Jeffrey Goh, the largest global airline alliance consisting of 26 member airlines, part of our work shifting conversation. Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining us. So do you think of vaccine passports or digital health passes, which is a totally unproven concept, by the way, do you think these will become the standard? Well, Emily, thank you. Good, uh, good evening uh, for having me on your show. But if you just indulge me for 30 seconds of some background context, I think um, it's worth reiterating that the industry has been through the deepest and darkest crisis that is ever experienced, and perhaps beyond the industry too. Um, we've had the virus, we've had the crisis for more than a year now. And somewhere at the beginning of this crisis, we all thought that this was a temporary thing, was going to blow over, and then it became clear that it was just going to be more than temporary, and we introduced testing. And then when it became clear that we've got to learn to live with this virus, then appeared vaccines. Um, and I think in that sense, we've come a long, long way uh, in this past year to begin to talk about a vaccine passport or a vaccine pass. And I think it's understandable that there is the excitement, the optimism that this could be uh, the tool, uh, not only to reopen uh, international travel, but also for general uh, economic activities. But I think two comments are worth making, uh, in spite of all the optimism and all the uh, enthusiasm on vaccine and, and, and vaccine passport. First, I think we have at least certainly been making the, the call that we cannot simply depend on vaccine and vaccine alone at the moment to reopen the industry. Uh, because if we did so, there probably won't be much of an industry left. Just by taking into account, notwithstanding the rapid production uh, rates of vaccines, uh, but also the distribution of vaccine, the rollout of vaccines, uh, the acceptance by some people you know, of uh, inoculation, and we simply cannot depend on just vaccination to reopen or restart the industry. Testing and a robust testing protocol needs to be, continues to be a, a significant part of um, uh, that piece of jigsaw that will reopen the industry. And the second point I think is worth making here is that um, it is not really just about a vaccine passport because it also needs to be a passport or a pass that takes into account testing or the status of a, uh, of a person's uh, health, uh, health position. But the concept of vaccine right. passport is, 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 is loaded, is loaded with a multitude of policy considerations and almost certainly uh, a, a multitude of policy outcomes because the ethical considerations are practical considerations that need to be, be borne in mind. Right. Certainly there are and probably will be plenty of people who don't get vaccinated, people who can't get vaccinated. We know the vaccine isn't being distributed equally. Um, number one, what do you think is the future of travel and business travel? I I've heard both sides that everything's going to come back just the way it was, even business travel. And, and, and I've heard other CEOs tell me uh, travel company CEOs, they think travel will be forever changed and business travel may never return. 
Yeah, I think um, for, for, for the time being, and it has been for, for some months now that the expectation continues to be that leisure travel will return first. And we've seen a, a different pockets over the last year or so uh, that leisure travel uh, has a, a degree of pent up demand. Um, I think there is still a continuing belief that business travel will return, and certainly we are one of those believers. Uh, but to what extent business travel will return to the pre-crisis level, that remains a big question. And uh, we think that uh, from talking to our members from the industry assessments, it's probably going to have a structural change of maybe 20% less, 25% less, just by the nature of uh, having lived through this year, using technology, lived through this year, um, through um, interactions by different means. But I think it's also worth pointing out that at some point, business travel is going to return to its robust levels, maybe not to the 100% that it was pre-crisis, but because you know there's a human nature that craves travel. And for business travel, it isn't just about the transaction itself. Uh, business meetings is also about emotions. Business meetings is also about relationships. So I think, I think one has to appreciate that at some point, um, you know, business is going to get up, uh, business travel is going to get up to that robust level, uh, perhaps not to, to exactly identical levels of pre, pre-crisis. So, Jeffrey, how, what would you say then, what about travel do you think will be forever changed post-pandemic? For example, will we be, be wearing masks forever um, when we're in those sort of confined situations? Yeah, I think there are certain aspects of our travel experience that will change. Family. I think um, from a customer expectation perspective, I think uh, there will be more expectation of flexibility in travel uh, so that if, uh, you know, circumstances change uh, because of this new restriction or that new restriction, uh, the flexibility and the ability to change your travel uh, uh, itinerary, I think that will be one of the expectations of business travelers going forward. Uh, but also more generally, business or leisure travelers, I think there will be, I mean, it's growing now, the customer expectations of um, a more seamless and touchless experience, hygienically safer experience as they travel um, through, through, through the airports as well as on board, on board the airlines. And, and I think, you know, um, I think credit has to be given to the airline industry, uh, both within Star Alliance and outside Star Alliance, in terms of adopting measures uh, that address the uh, hygiene, safety, right. and the expectation of customers. Um, well, you know, I know so many of us just can't wait to travel again. So um, appreciate all the efforts that the airline industry has made. Jeffrey Go, Star Alliance CEO, will continue to follow this vaccine passport issue and see how that plays out. All right, coming up, HBO Max and the box office roaring after the blockbuster debut of Godzilla versus Kong. We're going to talk about Warner Media's hybrid release strategy and what it means for the future of movie going. That is next. This is Bloomberg. HBO Max had the biggest increase in video streaming last week as the monster clash Godzilla vs. Kong debuted. The platform seeing a 5.4% jump in users launching its mobile app, according to Bloomberg's analysis of Aptopia data. Joining us now for more, Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw. And Lucas, the most surprising thing is that people actually went to theaters to see it, even though it was also available at home. What do you make of the success of this hybrid strategy for this one movie in particular? You know, it's the first movie where we've seen people go in droves to the box office. I think it's a it's a vote of confidence for theaters, for studios who feel that, you know, when theaters are back at full strength or at least at fully open, that people will want to go. Uh, but it also is, you know, a vote of confidence in this strategy that AT&T had with HBO Max of using the Warner Brothers movies to drive subscribers. It, it seems kind of like a win-win. It's, it's rare that you see one of those in business, but it's worked out pretty well. Does this mean that every movie has to be like Godzilla versus Kong if it's going to get people to the theaters, though? I, I think the types of movies you see in theaters will be those huge spectacles like Godzilla versus Kong. I don't think you could release some you know, intimate adult drama and expect millions of people to go to the theaters right now. But I think for those big movies, people will want to see them on the big screen. And the fact is, is that we're not going to have movies available day and date really starting next year. 
So this is more of a you know a pandemic experiment at the moment to see what works like this. At the same time, this seems to be the exception at the moment, and I and I wonder if. Even so, we're still going to see more companies do this hybrid model. I mean, you know, whether it's Netflix or Disney Plus, the CEO of Disney just t told me a, a couple of weeks ago that their next movie that's coming out in May, they're going to decide at the last minute whether to release it at home as well. Yeah, I think for the for the duration of the pandemic, at least, you're going to see a lot of experimentation with similar models, and you're going to see a lot of studios and media companies pouring over the results of Godzilla vs. Kong to figure out what they can learn from it. I think longer term, there's no question that, that those windows between theatrical and streaming are closing. What we don't know is sort of, are they going to settle on day and date? Are they going to settle on 30 days? Are they going to settle on 45 days? It's going to be shorter than 90 it was, though. Right. All right. Fascinating stuff. Makes me kind of want to go to the movies for the first time in a while. Bloomberg Fluka Shaw, thank you so much for that update. And thanks for watching this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Big reminder that we've got a big special show coming up later this week. Chip Crunch, we're going to be looking in depth at the global semiconductor shortage from all sides, featuring interviews with industry executives and more. That's Wednesday, right here on Bloomberg Technology. This is Bloomberg.